The topic of the month is use of weather information. In the video presentation that follows, we'll discuss where to find weather information and how to use it to make solid pre- and in-flight decisions. This presentation covers weather products, a priority topic of the General Aviation Joint Steering Committee. This information is provided by the FAST team to enhance aviation safety. Hi everybody, I'm Delia Colbin with FlyRight Pilot Education. Weather is the most lethal of all major causes of GA accidents. In fact, it is a failure to recognize deteriorating weather, which continues to be a frequent cause or contributing factor of accidents. Now, I have spent most of my career looking at weather and also investigating accidents, incidents, and deviations. And one of the things that I've found is that, you know, pilots just don't know what they don't know. I think of Scott Crossfield, who was at one time the most experienced rocket plane pilot in the world. Now, he was flying from northern Alabama back home to Manassas. There were some storms that were developing there. He got his briefing at 8.30 in the morning, took off at 10.30, flew right into a cell of extreme precipitation, and we lost one of our great pilots. Another one, Steve Fawcett, record-setting aviator, renowned glider pilot, so he knew winds. He was flying on the eastern side of the Sierra. Now, the Sierra go from near sea level up to about eleven to 14,000 feet. If the winds are out of the west at 20 knots or more at the crest of those mountains, which they almost always are, you're going to have some severe downdrafts. That day, we had a pilot report indicating that winds up at the crest were near 35 knots, and we lost another one of our great pilots. So pilots say, if it can happen to a Steve Fawcett or, or a Scott Crossfield, how can I avoid that? Well, there's some things that you can do, most certainly. Now, prior to 2005, most GA pilots phoned flight service for a standard weather briefing. Since then, we've gotten some fantastic online tools, and now over 93% of all pilots self-brief. But the important thing is that you have to know the steps that can help you make really good, safe aviation weather decisions. And the number one tool is the standard weather brief. You'll want to get it within two hours of your flight time, and you also want to get an update brief within 30 minutes. Now, an update brief is just going to give you the changes since you got your standard weather brief. I recommend you do it right before your run-up. You can call flight service and get it, or you can have it delivered to you via the internet with 1-800-WEATHERBRIEF.COM. So a standard weather brief is a tool that identifies most all potential hazards. It is in a checklist format, and it helps you quickly, within about five to 10 minutes with practice, assess potential hazards. It significantly reduces the risk of weather-related accidents, and also will help you identify which direction to go if you've got some weather occurring. Now, here is the standard weather brief. The only one that is not weather-related is number seven, which is NOTAMs. We do have some in the adverse conditions, however. So other than NOTAMs, where would you expect to find weather hazards? Now, if you answered everything except for NOTAMs, you would be 100% correct. What you're doing in all these steps is looking for the hazards, trying to identify where you're going to find IFR, mountain obscuration, turbulence, low-level wind shear, mountain wave, mechanical turbulence, which is disruption of airflow, icing, and thunderstorms. You're looking for those in these other areas. And I've just given away my answer for the next one. However, there's a couple of things that you also I also like to add to that, and that is bad winds. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Also, the aviation forecast discussion. Now, notice in the current conditions, it's not just looking at METARs, but it's also looking at the PIREPS. You want to look at the satellite and the radar. However, I like to do that in an overview. Now, satellite, what you've got to do when you're looking at satellite is you've got to animate it. You've got to know whether you're looking, whether you're looking at snow, whether you're looking at fog or stratiform or convective activity. The way that you do that is you animate it and you've got to know how to read it. Surface analysis is another one of my go-to tools. I am looking for where there's instability. I'm looking for where there's any kind of frontal system and what kind of winds are going to be a factor there. 
whether it's bringing a moist flow and what kind of how it's going to interplay with that terrain. Now radar, I see a lot of pilots heavily relying on radar. Radar is the least reliable of the current conditions if you're using the surface space radar like in or XM Weather or ADSB in. Now I like to do my overview on aviationweather.gov. I think they've got a host of really great tools. We're going to loop it and you can see the development of these thunderstorms. Look all across here, all through here. Those are actually pretty nasty thunderstorms. And if you were flying into those, it could be a problem for you. Down here, you might be able to navigate, but remember you want to stay at least 20 miles away from these. Now here is radar. I spoke about radar just a little bit earlier. Most of the radar that you're going to be looking at is going to be from a mosaic. Now a mosaic is where you've got these radar sites all across the country and the meteorologist is setting it up to determine what they want from that specific site. So you can have a 10 to 20 minute delay from what this time is to the current time. Also it's taking it and it's condensing it into one picture. So cells that are actually very nasty looking don't look so nasty here. As a matter of fact, if you look in the northern half of Alabama, it doesn't look like there's much going on, yet we saw that there were some uh, CBs that were, were going through their life cycle there. So be sure that you are using satellite or radar for what its purpose is, and that is to make long-range decisions. Unless you've got onboard radar with the, the dish on the aircraft, you're going to use this just for long-range planning. Now this is a surface analysis. The thing to know about this portion of the country is that you got a couple of things. You got the Appalachians coming down here. You also got a flow either from the Atlantic or from the Gulf. And so if you're between spring and fall, there's a lot of instability down there and you're going to see some thunderstorms usually in the afternoon between again spring and fall. However, if you've got a low pressure system or any kind of frontal system down in this area, you're going to have unpassable thunderstorms and that's what Scott Cossfield flew into. Now one of my favorite tools for getting a briefing is 1-800-WeatherBrief.com. It is so much better than anything I've ever seen for briefing and it can actually reduce information overload with the use of next gen briefing. There's some great tools. So you're going to click on flight planning and briefing, enter your pilot information, click on the standard weather brief and it's going to bring up this. Now here we've got adverse conditions, synopsis, surface analysis, current weather forecast, and no temps. That you may recognize as your standard weather brief. Over here we've got a terrain and color map. I think it's great if you're looking on a TFR. You could use a sectional to state, make sure that you're staying clear of things. You can send yourself a copy of this or print it out. Now over here, one of the features that I really love is see this red dot with the white exclamation mark. There's also a time next to it. What that's telling you is that the convective sigmet or whatever you're ha you happen to be looking at is active while the flight is estimated to traverse the area. There's also a darkened arrow there. That's because there's another convective sigmet and you would find out what time that was going to affect you. Now one of the things to know on adverse conditions is that you've got a host of these. The first two are have to do with no TAMs, TFRs and closed and unsafe runways. Please make sure and check your alternate airports as well as any airport that you're doing touch and goes, stop and goes, uh, full stops, enter those into the alternate fields and check those. Now AirMet is a broad picture of what that meteorologist thinks is going to be a factor for you. However, it has to cover at least 3,000 square miles and over 50% of the area. So as you can imagine, we're not going to get all the air mets and sometimes there's going to be air mets and the conditions don't actually materialize. So there is a long gap between the forecast of an air met and the severe weather of a convective SIGMET, SIGMET, Urgent Pilot Report, Center Weather Advisory or Severe Weather Watch. You've got to be able to, your job as a pilot is to find out what is causing those factors and if they are really going to be a factor for you and how you're going to avoid them if they do materialize. Now then, in the current conditions, you can actually take a look. See, here we've got almost all VFR conditions here. However, we saw something on the satellite that looked like there was more weather developing. So you can scan down here and you can actually see, look at this. At Macon, they have wind gusts up to 24 knots. They've got thunderstorms, light rain, uh, and it's saying lightning distant north through east. All through here, we see lightning and we also see thunderstorms, heavy rain right here. 
So you've got a good picture of what weather you may be looking at. Also in the tabs, you're going to be able to find this. And here it's highlighting within 24 minutes of our passing time, the weather is expected to change there. Or CBs, CB cumulonimbus, developing thunderstorms, that's what that means. The NRU forecast is done in MSL. The METARs and the TAFs are going to be in AGL. Why is that? Because we want to know whether we can get in or out of those airports. But once we're en route at a particular altitude, let's say that we're flying along at 5,000, 6,000 feet, we want to know where clouds are going to be in, in conjunction with our altitude, where the turbulence is going to be, the icing, etc. And so everything, almost all the other forecasts are going to be in MSL. I like to go to aviationweather.gov for the graphical forecast for aviation, which replaced the area forecast. It's going to be under Tools, GFA. And when you get here, you're going to see ceiling. Ceiling is broken to overcast layer above ground level and clouds. We're looking at clouds because we want to know the en route forecast. So here I've zoomed in. We're selecting bases. We want to know what the bases of the clouds are. And we've zoomed in and we can see here we've got bases at 2,000 overcast layered up to 10,000. Here 1,500 overcast, tops 900,000. Again, these are not ceilings. These are layers. Can we make it between these two points VFR? And the answer is you have to know what the surface elevation is. My guess is no. And you can also see down here a summary of that when you click on that. Now, if we wanted to know what the ceiling is, we could click on that and it's going to bring that up in a color coding. Now, down here it's saying lamp ceilings. What does that mean? That is the model that they're using. And this is based on MOS forecast, which is model output statistics, basically a uh, automated TAF. So here you can see in this area, cloud layers are running between 300 and 500. That's where the ceilings are. So could we make that BFR? Heck no. The other tool that I really love here is the aviation forecast discussion. Now the TAFs are the most accurate of the forecast tool bar none. The guys and gals that do the TAFs are fantastic at really seeing what's going on in their airports. However, the TAF is extremely limited in what it can tell you. So you can go to forecast and aviation forecast discussion and that meteorologist is going to give you in plain language what they think is going to happen. So you can click on your area and up comes a forecast. This one says broken to overcast cloud decks within the 2,000 to 9,000 foot MSL layer over and west of the mountains. What is that saying? Mountain obscuration, right? And then it's saying local visibility is two to five miles. So that is all uh, giving us a very plain language idea of what's going to happen there. That's a great tool for you there. Now the bad wind profiles is another fantastic tool. Most of the accidents that I've looked at have been caused by wind. The bad winds give you real-time winds from the first thousand feet above ground level all the way up to 50,000 feet at every Doppler radar site across the country and they're updated every five to ten minutes. Uh, VAD stands for velocity meaning speed, azimuth meaning horizontal direction and display. This is the site I recommend. This is one of the best and you click on that and then you can click on you know, you want to look at a couple of these when you're, unless it's right over your airport. It's starting at the first thousand feet above ground level, which here happens to be a thousand feet. It goes all the way up to 50,000 feet. Here's the time. It's showing you about every five to ten minutes. Let's zoom in here. The wind barbs, if they're green to blue, that, that means reliable. Yellow to red means not so reliable. That would typically be bugs, bats, birds, that kind of thing. ND means no data or nothing detected. They're not picking up any wind here. So this one starting at 1,000 feet. I would be checking the 1,000 feet with the surface winds at that airport or in, near that airport to find out if there's going to be any change. Now keep in mind, this is uh, showing us which way the wind is blowing to. So the wind is blowing to, it's pointing to the northwest. And we always name winds from where they're coming from. Why? Because we want to know what characteristics they're bringing. So the wind is coming out of the southeast at 5 knots. And then at 2,000 feet, switching around to be out of the west at 5 knots. This little short bar is 5 knots. So can you have turbulence where you have nothing detected or calm winds and you have some winds right next to it? Absolutely can. Think of two bodies of water that are converging. One's moving very slowly. One's moving very rapidly, maybe in a, at a different angle. 
where they come together there is going to be a lot of friction and that friction is what's going to cause turbulence now when we see these longer barbs those are 10 and if you saw a triangle that would be 50 knots so any place you're looking in changes in directions or changes in velocity in velocity you can expect to see some turbulence here's my top tips to get a better briefing number one go through every element of the standard weather brief on 1-800-weatherbrief.com Two, be the pilot in command. Make sure you get every piece of information that you need. Three, do an overview. Four, use aviationweather.gov to check the satellite and radar, the GFA, graphical forecast for aviation, and the aviation forecast discussion. Five, use pilotsandweather.com slant Sierra Sierra Romeo dot HTML or bad winds. Six, get a standard weather brief within two hours of your flight and an update brief within 30 minutes. And seven, educate yourself on aviation weather. Understanding weather is vital to your health. I hope you got that from this and I hope it's been helpful. Thanks for joining me. Please direct any questions to your local FAST team representative. Narration by Bradford Wood, FAST Team National Outreach Manager. There's nothing like the feeling you get when you know you're playing your A game, and in order to do that, you need a good coach. So fly regularly with a CFI who will challenge you to review what you know, explore new horizons, and to always do your best. Of course, you'll have to dedicate time and money to your proficiency program, but it's well worth it for the peace of mind that comes with confidence. Vince Lombardi, the famous football coach, said, Practice does not make perfect. Only perfect practice makes perfect. For pilots, that means flying with precision, on course, on altitude, on speed, all the time. And be sure to document your achievement in the WINGS proficiency program. It's a great way to stay on top of your game and keep your flight review current. Your presence here shows that you are a vital member of our general aviation safety community. The high standards you keep and the examples you set are a great credit to you and to GA. Thank you for attending.